Our next speaker is bringing us a lesson on continue to yield your body a living sacrifice to God. All of these lessons, of course, a general theme of, as Christians, how we remain faithful in the Lord's church. Brother John West is a very capable gospel preacher, faithful to the cause of Christ. John's married to the former Sonia Cottle. They have three children, Lauren, Jonathan, and Joshua. And we were blessed greatly when they came to be a part of this congregation. And so much they have done in helping us and growing and developing. You know, many times there are those people who move into an area and all of us in different churches have had some sort of contact like this. You know, what do you have for the youth? What do you have for this? What do you have for that? I made a comment just a short time ago from this pulpit. We of this congregation and every congregation that is deemed faithful as the New Testament defines faithfulness ought to be asking anybody that calls us whom we don't know, what are you going to do for this congregation if you become a member of it? Are you going to cause trouble? Are you going to be a good Bible class teacher? Are you going to be at all of the services? Are you going to help us be faithful and walk the straight and narrow way? And you're willing to make any sacrifice in order to do that? Is that what you're bringing to us? Are you going to be high maintenance and have to be petted all day long every day? Or you're going to get mad and leave? Well, if you're going to do that, don't come in the first place. And that's, uh, that can't be said about John, Sonia, and their family. They're a godly family, and we appreciate him very much. And uh, John graduated Memphis School of Preaching in 89, Faulkner University in 91, with a BA in Bible, and Freed Hardeman University in 2000 with a Master's of Ministry degree. And he also, uh, after going through all of that and preaching 20 years or whatever, he was qualified then to go through the Houston Community College Police Academy. Uh, it might be interesting, after paying all that time as a preacher, why you would now feel the need to go through the police academy and become a law enforcement officer. But I think we preachers can sort of understand why that might be. He works as an instructor and academic dean for Truth Bible Institute and uh, preaches regularly for the Dayton Church of Christ over here not far from us to our east, Dayton, Texas. And he is a deputy for the Montgomery County, Texas Sheriff's Office. Preachers? I ought to tell you something. Be careful. We're glad to have him. We look forward to this message on continue to yield your body a living sacrifice. Brother John, come speak to us. Okay. It is once again my privilege to be in front of you again to this year. I always enjoy this. Enjoy the lectureships uh, here and at other places, but particularly enjoyed here helping with this now. I started coming in 2003 as a speaker, and really in 2003 never imagined moving to Texas. And within four years, we were living out here, and we're enjoying it, and love being out here, love the brethren here, and appreciate the work that David is doing, the elders, uh, and the entire congregation. You would be turning your Bibles today to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, we're going to notice verses 1 and 2. The topic that's been assigned to me today is continue to yield your body as a living sacrifice to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul starts this chapter by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, I believe, is one of the most practical chapters in the Bible. When you read these 21 verses in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, it gives you a practical guide for your life here on this earth. And if you can follow these particular verses, it will help you in so many things in your life. If you look in the first two verses that we're going to be talking about today, we're told the basics of Christian living. If you try to live your life without these basic principles, the rest of Romans 12 would be meaningless. Because when you read the first two verses, it sets the stage for everything else in this chapter. It sets the stage, first of all, for the Christian to be humble, next to be caring, to follow after good, to practice brotherly love, 
To be a working Christian and a working person, it sets the stage for us having hope and patience while continuing in prayer. Without these first two verses that we're going to be noticing today, we would have a hard time being benevolent in this life, forgiving others. We would have problems with unity without being able to follow these two verses. We would have a problem with honesty, with being peaceable, and with helping others, including our enemies. And these are all the things that are covered in Romans chapter 12. We're not going to look at the rest of the chapter. We're primarily going to center our focus on the first two verses. So let's look at these two verses as, as we go through them and help us understand how we can yield our bodies as a living sacrifice, be the kind of people we need to be in this life so that we can not only encourage others and help others, but that we also can go to heaven ourselves. Christianity is a life of sacrifice. Those who are living the life of a Christian understand that there are sacrifices that we must make. I've talked to people in the past about their lives and, and about some of the things maybe they're doing. And when you start talking about pet sins, things that they like that are not in harmony with God's Word, they're not willing to conform their life to God's Word to give up these things. I've heard people say, well, why do I need to stop doing that? I'm enjoying this. Well, if you notice in the book of Hebrews chapter 11... When Moses said he would rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, we understand that even Moses recognized that sin is pleasurable. If it wasn't, folks, no one would want to commit sin. The devil entices us. He dangles that in front of us saying, look at this. This is fun. Why don't you do this? Realizing all along he's pulling us away from God and so many people take that bait. I love to fish. I don't fish like I would like to. My boys still fish a lot more than I do. And they're constantly looking for bait. We go to academy. Now in the fall, the winter, we look at guns anytime we go to academy. That's kind of a given. But we look at the guns or the hunting section. But in the springtime, they'll start saying, Dad, take us to academy. We've got to look for fishing baits. And they're always looking for a new bait. They're looking for new things where they can catch the fish. Satan is a fisherman. And he's putting new baits in front of us, new temptations. Although we understand 1 John 2, 15 through 17, they're the three basic temptations. They never change. It's just masked in a different form at times. So Satan has these baits he's putting in front of us, trying to cause us to take it. Now, back last year, the boys had been fishing for a little while and called me on the phone and said, Dad, come down and go fishing. I said, okay. So I grabbed my pole and went down. And I made about three casts, brought me a bass in about like this. They'd been there for a couple hours and didn't get a bite. They couldn't understand, how did you do that? Well, I know what bait to use. I have certain baits that when I go fishing, I'll use on certain things. And I know at a particular time of the year what those bass are going to be biting. Well, of course, they were digging my tackle box trying to find what I was using. That particular, I was using a worm. That particular worm was my last one. I said, there are other worms in there, but you can't have this one. There are certain ways that we catch fish, certain baits that we use. And Satan does the same thing with us. These basic principles, if we follow them, will keep Satan from destroying us spiritually and will help us to continue our fight against him. When you look at Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, you might want to write that down. I'm not going to read it. It gives us the armor in which we're to wear. Well, we can fight against Satan and his devices. And if we put this armor on and we continue to fight, it will help us overcome all these temptations that we're faced with every day. But let me ask a question. Looking at these two verses and, and what we're going to study and what we've already read, if this is so practical and simple, why is it so hard for so many people to follow it? Why are so many people in this world entangled in sin when they don't have to be? It's partly because of what Satan does in enticing us. But it is also because there are people that love the world more than they love God. And the pull of the world is a lot stronger to them than the pull of God's Word. That's why we have so many people living in sin today. That's why there's so many people who have turned their back on God or have never come to God and have no desire to come to God because they enjoy what they're doing. 
And they simply don't want to change. Well, Romans 12 is a basic guide for the proper change in our lives and the dedicated service that we need. And as we turn our attention to this text, we want to notice, I'm going to break down verses 1 and 2. And notice in these two verses the things that will help us to live in a sacrificial way as we continue to yield our, our bodies as a sacrifice to God. First of all, in Romans 12, verse 1, we have a total sacrifice. God expects us to be totally committed to Him. And Paul stresses to the Romans in this passage the need for total sacrifice in the life of a Christian. Paul's beginning words in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, I beseech you. The old King James tells us it means to beg or to entreat. Paul is telling the Romans, listen to what I'm saying. Pay close attention to what I'm about to write to you because it's important for you in your life. Folks, when we tell you something, pay close attention to this, watch out for this, it doesn't mean I'll forget it, I'll do what I want to do. I'm amazed at work. People can't observe simple signs. People can't observe lights flashing. I was talking with Corey last night after services since he's working as a medic now in Montgomery County, uh, we were sharing some stories and we were talking about working accidents and he's talked about nearly being hit. Well, just this past week, we had to shut a road down because of an accident. And the road was shut down. There was a lane you could go in, but we had our medics out there. We had, all of us were out there. Witnesses were there. So we shut the road down. Two o'clock in the morning, it was not very well traveled, so people came up on it. They could see it. And I'm looking for my safety and the safety of our people out there more than I am somebody with lack of patience wanting to get home. This guy just drives around all the lights in the wrong lane. Luckily, nothing was coming. And he couldn't even see around where he was until he got into the lane. Well, I yelled at a lot of people. And I, I didn't yell at him. I, I was nice to him. I stopped and I told him, or stopped him. I said, what are you doing? I'm going home. Were you directed to go home? No. Why'd you do it? Because I wanted to. See, that's the problem we deal with in this life. When it comes to a spiritual aspect of it, people do what they want to do rather than what God tells them to do. This gentleman told me, I didn't see anything coming, so I went around it. So you went in the wrong lane. Yeah, so what? You were not directed to do that. You saw the lights. So? I was biting my tongue at that point. I was just trying to get him on down the road. I, I wanted to say a whole lot more than what I did. I just told him to go. If I ever saw him doing it again, I'd write him a ticket. I just didn't want to go over and get my ticket book out then and write it. And, or I'd have stopped him right in the middle of the road and written him a ticket. But that's what we deal with. People have their own idea and their own ways of what they want to do, regardless of what anyone else says, regardless of what any authority tells them to do, they do what they want to do. And that's a problem in this life. And that's why so many people have turned their back on God or have never even tried to turn to God in the first place. Because life's too fun for them. God expects a total commitment. When Paul said, I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, listen to me, there's something important. Like I was mentioning in this wreck, when people see lights, they ought to say, hey, this is something important. I need to stop. I need to look. I need to know what's going on here. Not I'm going to do what I want to do. But that happens all the time. But Paul appeals to the mercies of God in this verse. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. The mercies of God is why we enjoy what we do today. God in His mercy saved us from our sins when He redeemed us by the precious blood of Jesus. And Paul taught to the Romans elsewhere in the book that the mercies of God were tied to a lot of things. It was tied, first of all, to the peace of God. Chapter 5 and verse 1. To having access to His grace. Chapter 5 and verse 2. Giving us freedom from sin. Chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And the hope of eternal life. In chapter 6, verse 23. We want the mercies of God. And Paul is saying, I'm begging you, brethren, by God's mercy. Listen to what I'm saying. And follow this. And without God's mercy, no blessing would be here today. Because it's through God's mercy that He sent His Son to die for us. We need to be thankful for that blessing. We need to rely on God's mercy. I want His mercy. I don't want His justice. His justice is you're guilty. His mercy is my son saved you. And when we yield our bodies as a living sacrifice doing His will, 
we enjoy the mercies of God rather than the justice of God. Because of God's mercy, He does expect 100% commitment to Him. And He has a right to expect it due to the price that was paid. But further, not only does Paul tell us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, but he said that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We are to be living sacrifices to God. Our bodies ought to be presented as such. When an animal is given in sacrifice in the Old Testament, it was the entire animal given. But it was a dead sacrifice. That animal was slain on an altar. Or slain and offered upon an altar as a sacrifice before God. And the book of Hebrews tells us that those sacrifices could not make the comer there unto perfect. The animal sacrifice could not totally take away sins. It took the blood of Jesus to take away man's sins. So when we look in the Old Testament sacrifices, it was an animal, but the whole animal was given. And in the New Testament, we're told that we're to be a sacrifice, but not that we're offered on an altar and our body slain for a sacrifice, but we're a living sacrifice. As we sacrifice ourselves to God, part of this total sacrifice, total commitment to Him, that we live for Him. And that's what Paul is trying to teach these people. The, the sacrifice as living what stood in stark contrast to the old law and that sacrifice. And through one's faithfulness unto death, he will be able to receive that crown of life and live forevermore. In the book of Revelation 2 verse 10, it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Through one's faithfulness, it will help us to achieve that crown of life one day. Paul expressed it to the Galatians in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live not for the flesh, but I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's a living sacrifice. That's what Paul wanted the Galatians to understand when he wrote them. And he said it in a different way in Romans 12, 1 and 2, but telling the Romans the same thing. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If we're to be blessed both materially and most of all spiritually, we're to continually put the kingdom of God first in our lives, as Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first, he said, the kingdom of God. Not second, not third, whenever you want to, whatever is left over in your life. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Further, our sacrifice is not to be a half-hearted, occasional sacrifice. Our sacrifice is to be the very best that we have to offer, given every day as we live here upon this earth. The Hebrew writer stated in Hebrews 13, Verses 15 and 16. By Him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips. Giving thanks to His name. But to do good. And communicate forget not. For with such sacrifices. God is well pleased. Not only does Paul tell us we're to be a living sacrifice. But he said that living sacrifice is to be holy. And acceptable unto God. It's not what is acceptable to men, but to God that we're to attain. First of all, it says to be holy. The Greek word hagios, holy, is set apart. It puts us in a different category than everybody else in the world. And when we yield our bodies as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice it encompasses that holiness. Over and over and over again. The New Testament teaches holiness for our own lives. Without it, we can't be pleasing to God. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, But as he which hath called you is holy, be ye also holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He which hath called you is holy. We serve a holy God. Peter says, now you be holy in your life. That's what God expects from us. 
Under the Old Testament law, when animals were brought for sacrifices, how were they to be without blemish? They couldn't just find the run of the bunch, a little sickly animal, and say, eh, that's good enough. I won't use that. I'm going to cull that one anyway. I think I'll give that to God. Would God accept that sacrifice from them? No. He wanted the very best that they had to offer. And that's what he expects of us today, folks. It hasn't changed. We're not offering animals. Anyone can come up with an animal to offer that, particularly during that time, the people that raise the animals. They could go out into their stock and find an animal to give to God. God said, I want your best. And in our lives today, he tells us the same thing. On the day of judgment, Christ will present his church to the Father without blemish. In the book of Ephesians 5.27, Paul is recording this saying that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, nor wrinkle, nor any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Folks, God wants the church holy. God wants the church blameless. God wants the church without blemish. And since we are members of the church collectively, as well as individually, we must maintain that holiness in our lives. It's not that we have the whole group, maybe some are holy and some are not, but the ones that are not holy, well, we're part of a holy group, so that, that covers us too. I remember years ago, first, matter of fact, first congregation where I preached in Mississippi, we lost our eldership. And we had Brother Robert Taylor come in to speak about elders, had an uh, entire weekend. Pretty much he presented his book on the elder and his work. And during question and answers, the last night, someone posed a question. What if all the men that you want to be put in as elders are not qualified, but the majority of them are, and everyone meets a few qualifications, doesn't that count to have an eldership? So the, the questionnaire was saying, okay, this man doesn't have all the qualifications, but he's a pretty good old boy. We like to put him in. These others have the rest of the qualifications, so surely he can ride on in on their coattails and, and they can have a good eldership. I, I kind of chuckled a little bit when I heard the question, but I also was saddened at the ignorance that people have, especially after having heard two full days of lecturing about the qualifications of elders. And for a question to come up was just beyond me. But, Dub, I've always heard, never underestimate the ignorance of the audience. <laughs> and I definitely understood that then. Okay, now let's bring that over to the church. We can't say because the majority of the people in the church are holy, that makes me holy. Great. I can ride their coattails. I'll go to heaven. I'll go out and do what I want to do. But I'm part of the holy church. So that makes me part of them and that, that helps me too. No, it doesn't work that way, folks. We already read in 1 Peter 1 that individually I'm to be holy. You're to be holy. And if someone is not holy within the congregation, not only does it hurt that individual for not being a Christian, not being a faithful Christian, but it can hurt the church as well. We have to understand true holiness in the lives of each one individually. Let's move on. Secondly, there is a reasonable service the sacrifice that we're to maintain. If you notice in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed, he said, to the world. It's a reasonable sacrifice that we're to have. Or let's go to the end of verse 1, your reasonable service. We can touch on that on this part before we go to verse 2. The sacrificial life is one that is reasonable. And logical for us to live. Some translations use the word spiritual instead of reasonable. It describes the kind of life that we're to live. Vine's Expository Dictionary defines reasonable as, and I quote, pertaining to the reasoning faculty, reasonable, rational, is used in Romans 12, 1 of service, to be rendered by the believers in presenting their bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. The sacrifice is to be intelligent in contrast to those offered by ritual and compulsion. 
The presentation is to be in accordance with the spiritual intelligence of those who are new creatures in Christ and are mindful of the mercies of God. And then he says, for the significance of the word in 1 Peter 2, 2, see under milk. So you go under milk and desire or craving the milk of the word is telling us that milk is spiritual food and it's reasonable. It is intelligent to do that. So what's the opposite of that? If a person doesn't follow God's word, that makes them what? Unintelligent or ignorant for not following it. That reasonable service is the most logical, intellectual service to follow. What else would we want to do, especially knowing God's word? So we can tell people the Christian life is the most logical life to live. You look at the, the illogical things that people do. I deal with people on a daily basis. They do things. I know why they do them when they tell me why they do them. But sometimes I just don't understand why they do some of the things they do. And we, we're called to some things that you get there and just shake your head. I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm dealing with this. And I've told people before, use your brain a little bit. Use your noodle you got. That will help you in life not to do what you're doing now. Or not to deal with what you're dealing with now. It takes a little logic. But with a lot of things in this life, logic has been thrown out the window, I believe, a long time ago with so many people. But the Christian life is a logical life to live. And when people can understand it and they're willing to sacrifice some things, it does mean sacrifice. I have people all the time saying, won't you go out and do this with me? No, I don't do that. Why not? Because I'm a Christian, I don't do that. Well, so, come and do it anyway. No, I don't do that. People at work sometimes will ask me that. I have people, friends when I lived in Alabama. Hey, preacher, why don't you come out and do this with us? No, I don't do that. Why not? Well, you want a long sermon or you want the short one? <laughs> Which version do you want? Most of the time they want the short one. They don't want to listen to a lot. Most of the time they'll just say, oh, that didn't matter. Just, just don't worry about it. People will entice you to do certain things because of them it's fun. They don't look at logic. The Bible tells us it's logical to live a Christian life. That's why in this life we should desire, as Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 2, or crave the milk of the Word. Why would a person not want to serve God? That's what I don't understand now. Why would a person not want to serve God knowing everything God has to offer? Oh, I know the world has a pull and it has a lot to offer, but the things of this world are fleeting and they'll pass and they'll be gone one day. But what God offers us will be for eternity. It's reasonable for us to do that. Finally, there is a transformed sacrifice. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Paul says, do not conform yourselves to this world. What would be conforming myself to the world? Like the illustration I just mentioned, people say, why don't you come over and do this? Now, all things in this world are not bad, folks. Sometimes people, because they have a personal dislike for something, they want to equate a personal dislike for sin. There are some personal dislikes that are not sin. But there are a lot of things in this life that are sinful that we don't engage in. But we have to recognize from God's Word, ascertaining true Bible authority, what is maybe my own personal likes and dislikes and what are categorized as sins. And we can understand what things are categorized as sins, we don't engage in those things. If I personally don't like something... And I've had people say, why don't you go do this? Or why don't we? No, I don't want to. Why not? I just don't like it. It may not be anything wrong with it. I just don't like it. So I can make up my mind what I want and don't want to do on personal things. But when it comes to God's Word, I have no choice. I do what He said. Because that's what the Bible teaches us. Paul tells us, don't conform yourselves. Even when temptations are present, we fight against those things. Not to conform our life to this world. Satan tempts us, 1 John 2, 16 tells us, with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And with those temptations, many times very strong, all hard to overcome. But with every fiber of our being as Christians, we fight to overcome. To do God's will, to have heaven as our home one day. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul lists the works of the flesh. And he tells us these things will keep you out of heaven. And if we practice those things, we won't be in heaven. And I've had people say, well, you know, God still loves you. He'll overlook some things. 
talked to a guy, or oh, I was in the jail the other night, and there, there was one of the jail deputies. Nice guy. He's always patting you on the back to come in talking, but he's got a foul mouth. And I was typing my arrest record out. I'd arrested someone, and he'd come over talking bad, and it was on the female side, and one of the female detention officers said, uh, don't talk like that. We've got a preacher here. He said, oh, he, God knows my heart. I ain't worried about him. And he went right on to talking bad. It's, oh, That's the attitude that so many people have. Oh, God knows my heart. It doesn't matter if I use his name in vain, and he was using God's name in vain. And then he finally walked off and left, and the other uh, detention officers there were going, glad he's gone. Well, he's got a mouth on him. But his own mind is, God knows my heart. It doesn't matter. I can use all the foul language I want. People do that with every area in this life. And they think, well, it's okay, God knows. I'm a good person. To them, they're a good person because they say they believe in God. Not that they're trying to live for Him. Folks, there's a difference. The Bible teaches us that when we yield our bodies a living sacrifice to God, we don't conform ourselves to what everybody else does. We transform our lives by the renewing of our minds. The word transform from the Greek is the word metamorpho. You know where we're going with this. It's from the English word metamorphosis. A change that takes place. I think one of the best examples, at least that I can think of, is think about the old caterpillar. You see the ugly little thing crawling on the ground. Then it forms a little cocoon. And then in a matter of weeks, it comes out a beautiful butterfly. It grows from crawling very, very slowly on the ground to flying through the air. And you can see the change that takes place. That's a metamorphosis, a change. And God expects us to change in our lives when we obey Him. Vines aptly said that it is a complete change in character and conduct. We must completely empty ourselves of the sins of this world and transform our lives and our minds in our service to God. I would say in that, you could look at Philippians 2, 1 through 8. We need to transform our minds to serve God. And for the Christian, it says it is in the mind, the mind or the heart, the intellect, our very being. We serve God faithfully to have heaven one day as our home. Paul teaches us that in renewing our minds, we set our affections on things above, not on things of this earth, as he told the Colossians in Colossians 3, 2. The inward man then is renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Psalmist David put it this way in Psalm 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. The law of God, the person that's happy and blessed, same thing, is the one who meditates on God's word. We think about it, then we put it into practice. Remember Paul's words in Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9? When he gives a list of these things, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are honest, and he goes through all of these things, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, he says, think on these things. Meditate on them. Verse 9, then he says, these things that you've seen in me, and you do. What you've seen in me in my life and what I've preached and what you've seen as my example, you do these things. You follow after these examples. So it's not just meditating upon it. It's putting into practice what we study. Not enough just to read it. Anybody can read a book. Anybody can read the Bible. I mean, people say, oh, I've read through the Bible five times. Well, you put it into practice. We can brag about reading the Bible 15,000 times. But if we don't put into practice what we read, what good does it do us? Well, it may do us a little good in knowing some things we should do, but if we're not practicing it, we're blind. And we cannot see afar off. While well, Peter told people to whom he wrote in 2 Peter 1, you add, you to faith, add to your faith virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness, brotherly kindness and charity. And he said in verse 8, If these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye should be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We add these things and we're not barren nor unfruitful. But he that lacketh these things, he says in verse 9, is blind and cannot see afar off. He's nearsighted. I'm a little nearsighted. I went and got contacts last week because I had a hard time reading license plates at night and seeing paper and 
Now I've got contacts. The doctor told me, well, you're going to have a harder time seeing up close. You're nearsighted, so my contacts are seeing a little bit further away. So now I've got my glasses that I already had before for reading that I thought I might have to put on today because there are some things that are hard to see close up. He's got it where I can see far off now. There are some people that are so nearsighted spiritually, they can't see far off. They can't see heaven. They can't see what is awaiting them. And they're not even concerned with it because they're living for the here and now anyway. And as long as they enjoy what they have now, they could care less about the future. Paul said if you, or rather Peter said, if you don't add these things and you don't continue in these things, you're blind and you can't see afar off. So we need to put into practice what God said so we can see not only close up the here and now, but more so that we're seeing in the distance what God has for us. When we as living sacrifices renew our minds, then we can prove or test what the perfect will of God is. Not that we're any kind of great proof, but our lives can be proof by us adhering to the Scriptures and the Word of God, living in harmony with them. The Word of God has already proven how to be perfect. We just simply show in our lives the perfect, revealed will of God when our lives are transformed. Ultimately, we prove it by allowing God to be in control of our lives through His Word. And as God has taught us in His Word, we simply transform our, our mind to prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Today, as we close this lesson, I do encourage each one of you and those who are listening on the Internet that we've been given a set of instructions. And when we can understand what those instructions are, we obey those things. And as we obey them, we live a life in harmony with God's Word. Not only receive God's spiritual blessings here, but ultimately have heaven one day. So many people have gone away from the Bible. Some people have totally denied the Bible. Some people say, well, you can't understand it. Years ago, I was writing newspaper articles, and I received a, a letter in the mail. And in this, the letter was a very brief statement, but it had two articles from a religious editor in, I think the, it was somewhere in Florida. They cut these articles out and sent them to me because I was talking about the importance of the Word of God and understanding it and obeying it and living by it. And the article that was sent to me from this religious editor basically said the Bible is a compilation of the books of men over several thousand years that has nothing to do with God. God has never given us any type of written instructions or any book to follow. The Bible is a jumbled mess of things that are confusing and hard to understand. So just do the best you can to let God sort you out in the end. Now I'm paraphrasing what about, about half of a page in an article. But that's what the guy was saying. Folks, I don't want to wait to the end to find out that I did something wrong and God didn't give me the instructions properly. I want to know now. And God has given us instructions. It's simply up to us to conform our lives to those instructions and to yield our bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto God. Don't sit down, I'm through. Thank you. <laughs> About four minutes and 39 seconds he gave back to us, if this is right. That's <clears throat> Remember that. Remember it well. That was an excellent, excellent lesson. Importance of putting into practice the words of God is the only way anybody is going to be holy as the New Testament or the Bible defines holy. There's just no way to have the mind of Christ and to live a righteous life except that you honestly listen and understand and begin to do what he tells you. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The Ecclesiastes writer said, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. We appreciate, Brother John, that excellent message. We look forward to others throughout today and the remainder of the lecture.